Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And my thanks also to Gresham College for the invitation to speak to you this evening and to the Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's for their kind welcome. You will have noticed that recently there's been quite a bit of discussion about what the real contribution is of Christianity to Western civilization, not to mention its contribution to British cultural identity. The current issue is normally phrased in terms of what the importance is of the secular in British life or Western life. Is it true that one of the great contributions to the world of European culture has been a kind of public freedom from or distance from religion? But when that is posed as an issue, people begin to speak about the importance of Christian categories and images as having helped to shape all that is most distinctive about European culture. And all sorts of questions begin to arise about the definition of multiculturalism and how far it can go. A lot of this current debate seems to be rather short on an understanding both of Christian history and of the nature of secularism. And what I would like to suggest tonight is that we may perhaps begin to get a better understanding of some of these questions by looking at Christianity's formative period, at the early centuries of Christian history, with a particular eye to those points of tension or newness that arose in relation to the society around. That will help us get a sense of what was and perhaps is different about Christianity. And it may also suggest some rather surprising conclusions about what Christianity has done for Europe. So in my reflections this evening, I want to look a little bit at three or four areas of early Christian language and reflection which stood out against the background of the day and helped to form a new kind of language about the world, about God, about society, about humanity. But before embarking on that, let me just issue one word of caution. It's quite easy to think, and there is a school of historians which encourages us to think, that Christianity arrived on the scene and somehow ruined a perfectly satisfactory, enlightened and tolerant classical culture. Classical culture, and I paraphrase here, obviously, classical culture is good at art, good at science, and good at non-dogmatic coexistence. In other words, classical culture is just the sort of culture we'd like to have. We need, before taking that on board uncritically, to bear in mind some features of the world into which Christianity came, which any modern culture would find rather difficult. Two of the governing factors in the public life of the ancient world would be irreducibly foreign to us. And they are, of course, the institution of slavery and the incorporation of religion completely into the social order. The late classical world in which Christianity had its origins was one in which slavery was universally taken for granted as a practice, even if sometimes questioned as a theory. It was also a world in which political authority was a religious matter, particularly in the Roman Empire, where the authority of the Roman emperor was reinforced by the cult of worshipping the emperor. 
Christian faith notoriously failed to challenge the first of these effectively. It took it some 1800 years to wake up to the fact that there was some tension between the Christian gospel and the institution of slavery, and that that was a tension which could actually be resolved by human decisions. It's an embarrassingly long gap. But on the second, on the religious quality of political power, Christianity had some very new and very disturbing things to say. And I'm going to suggest that if you grasp exactly how and why that worked, you may understand a number of other things about early Christianity, about its distinctiveness, and about some of its abiding cutting edge in our own context. So I shall begin with a few thoughts about what Christianity had to say about the state and its authority. In the accounts of the Christian martyrs, especially from the second century, you repeatedly come up against one particular moment when Christians are challenged as to whether they will take part in religious veneration of the emperor. It's the crucial question. The martyrs are the people who say they can't. But in some of the accounts of martyrdom, there's a little bit more to it than that. And one text which comes from North Africa in the mid-2nd century depicts the Christians being tried in court as saying that they were perfectly prepared to pray for the emperor but not to him. One of them says, we pray for the emperor, we pay our taxes. In other words, this Christian was saying, we regard ourselves as loyal to the state and we take part in the processes that make the state work and what's more, we pray for the good of the state. What we won't do is regard the state as sacred in itself. This was quite rightly seen as an extremely subversive idea. It suggested, you see, that individuals, even slaves, could in some degree negotiate their relationships with the state. They were not obliged to regard it as holy. There was another realm in which decisions might be taken, values and priorities fixed. And that tension is reflected in the language that the church used about itself. The early Christian community called itself an ecclesia using for itself the word normally used for an assembly of citizens in an ancient city. The assembly that reflected on public matters and took decisions together. So that, in effect, when the martyrs appear before their Roman judges, they stand for a citizen's assembly over against a holy empire. And although that doesn't instantly, overnight, create a new kind of Christian politics, it creates a very unsettling element within Roman society. Here are people claiming that in some area of their lives they belong outside the holy boundaries of the state and the empire. And the state begins, therefore, to be seen not as a sacred comprehensive system, but as a mechanism for getting things done. The martyrs I referred to a few minutes ago promise to pay their taxes. 
because that makes society work. But that's the level at which their loyalty is engaged. Their deepest belonging is with the community who are citizens of some other kingdom. And as time goes on, this becomes the foundation in the early church of a certain distance from political arrangements. When the Roman Empire finally becomes Christian in the fourth century, there are predictably some people who think it's the most wonderful thing that has ever happened and reinstate the whole idea of sacred authority associating it now with the Christian emperor. But there are others in the Greek and the Latin world who in effect say, we have been warned. We shouldn't expect too much from any kind of arrangement. There is still an area where God is what matters rather than the state. And the fate of any particular political arrangement doesn't dictate what happens to the Christian community. It becomes most evident in the work of St. Augustine at the very beginning of the fifth century, spelling out this distance or difference. Empires come and go. The community of God's people continues. Empires depend on aggression and control. The community of God's people depends on, to use a famous phrase he picks up from an earlier Latin writer, people who are in concord about what they love. So into the Western tradition comes an element of political skepticism and critique. Although the Christian church has again and again allied itself with political power, with hierarchies of more or less compromising kinds, it has always retained, even in the days when people were most uncritical about monarchs, that element of distance. It doesn't have to be like this. It might be different. Curiously, the doctrine of the divine right of kings, so passionately believed in by Anglicans at the beginning of the 17th century, was a little bit of an aberration in the history of Christian theology. Christians were not averse to blessing kings, queens, or emperors, but they were averse to regarding them as in every situation inspired controlled by God. Now, the interest in all this is, I believe, that it's the beginning of Christianity which itself begins to suggest secularism. There is a difference between living in the community of faith and living in the political community. The two communities engage with one another, argue with one another, and frequently have territorial battles. But the one thing you cannot say is that they're just the same thing. There is an area of public life and social interaction where, quite properly, the institution of the religious community doesn't dictate just as there is an area within the political realm that is not answerable only to political authority. I believe that this has been part of what you might call the political dynamism of the European tradition. It has allowed political authority to be argued about in a way which would have been very difficult in the ancient world 